So we are in two different places today, Luke chapter 22 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, take those out and uh, we'll get those. There might be a Bible or two in the pew in front of you, in the little pocket there. So Jesus instituted two ordinances um, and so we practice these two ordinances. Last week I preached on baptism, this week I'm preaching on communion. And these are the two things that Christ commanded us to do as believers. So the first is water baptism. The second is the Lord's Supper. Jesus participated in both of these. When the Apostle Paul taught these practices to the church at Corinth, somehow the deep meaning of the Lord's Supper was not passed on to the others. So the Corinthians began to misuse the Lord's Supper. I need to explain to you about the church at Corinth. So we all know dysfunctional people, right? Say yes. Yes, okay. And there's times where, all, where we might just shake our heads at how well, you want to go, what, what are they thinking? What are they thinking? And you might have even said something like, not my monkeys, not my circus. And you kind of walked away because you can only do so much. That's the church at Corinth. But Paul couldn't say, not my monkeys, not my circus, because he planted the church. But the church at Corinth was a mess. Now, where was Corinth? Corinth was located in modern-day Turkey. So if you go into the Middle East, that nice calm area over there where they have paradise going on and nothing ever happens, I say that in jest, that's where modern-day Turkey is. And Corinth was located there on an isthmus. So we're going to practice saying isthmus. Can you say isthmus? Yes, you'll probably never say that again. (laughs) but it's a land bridge and it's much smaller but it's the same concept as where the Panama Canal is how that is one of the narrowest spots that separates the Atlantic Ocean from the Pacific Ocean and so what did they do they dug a little canal through and they call it the Panama Canal and so we can get ships there we don't have to go all the way around down to the tip of South America and come all the way back up Lots of time and money saved in that. Well, back then, Turkey, or Corinth, was located in this little land bridge, and the city literally grew and sprung up because of what the traders would do. They would bring their ships in, dock on one side of this really small, within, it was only a couple miles that separated the two bodies of water. They'd bring the ships in on one side, unload the ships on the wagons and stuff, and they would take it to the other side, load it on different ships, and move on. So goods went back and forth, and trades went back and forth. There was always something going on there, and with that brought all kinds of different cultures and different religions. It really was a melting pot, a place where um, all kinds of crazy things happened. Back then, with many of the religions, their idea of worship was way crazy compared to what we might say is tolerable today. And so we're talking about, (coughs) excuse me, we're talking about such things as wild, crazy parties that involve things that wild and crazy parties involve. So when Paul planted this church, people came into the church 
from these different religions and from different cultures and all around. And they trusted Christ and were brought into the church. But as you know, when you come to Christ, that doesn't mean that all your baggage just drops off at the door. It doesn't mean that all your bad habits just suddenly <coughs> excuse me, disappear. In fact, a lot of times we become aware of things that we need to quit. We become aware of things that we know we shouldn't do anymore. And so sometimes it becomes a little bit of a fight to get rid of some of those things. When I came to Christ, God did several things that were immediate. Um, have anybody else come to Christ and God just completely wiped out one of your bad things that you were involved in? For me, it was my mouth. I had a really, really bad mouth. And when I came to Christ, it was as if the Lord just hit the delete button for me. Praise the Lord. Because it was bad. But there were other areas in my life the Lord allowed me to have to work through those things. And there are places, things in my life that I still struggle with. And I bet you do too. You have things in your life that you still struggle with. And you say, Lord, why don't you just take all that away? Why don't you just remove all that? And I think we have to understand that there are times when we need to learn to depend on him, to go to him, to trust him, and to work it out. In fact, Scripture says that we are supposed to work out our salvation. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to earn it, but that means that we're supposed to work out how we are to follow Christ. And the only way you learn that is to dive into his word and to see what the Bible says in getting things straightened out in our lives. So the Corinthian church was a mess. And I'm not kidding you when I say that. They would come together for um, and participate in the Lord's Supper, but they do it in what was called a love feast. So now I want you to understand in the situation that the early church was here, you're coming out of worship in other uh, religions and stuff that where they might have had orgies, drunken parties, and such as part of their worship. It was pretty crazy. So then the church is about, you know, coming together, following Christ, and they had these love feasts, which obviously could get misunderstood of what was going on there. But when these came together, can I, can I translate this into for the church? Let's change the word from love feast. Maybe you'll understand this better. You ready for this? Potluck. Potluck. You understand that one, right? The love feast was basically a potluck. And in the early church, they would come together. But the Corinthian church, I don't know, they just didn't get it. You don't see Paul writing to the other church plants and, and ever having to say what he says. There, I think we need to look at it. Verses 17 through 22 in 1 Corinthians 11. Go to 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 17, or verses 17 through 22. And here's the principle that we want to learn here from this, is that we need to honor God and others through our behavior. We need to honor God and others through our behavior. Let's see if the Corinthians were doing that. Verse 17, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Wow, they're off to a great start. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another, what's that say? Gets drunk. At a potluck? Hmm. See, what they would do back then is they'd get together to celebrate the Lord's Supper as an actual meal. 
It wasn't the little tiny pieces of bread and a little cup. It wasn't a pass around cup. It was a full blown meal. And that's the way that the Lord's Supper started out with. Verse 21, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, the other gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Are you, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Wow. Can you imagine? Now, <laughs> what I thought of was from my side of things as a pastor, sitting down and having to write back to a church that maybe I started or to some familiar people that spent a lot of time with. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he is a very smart guy. He was a Pharisee. And it's been discovered that all of his study probably equated to having several PhDs, so several doctorates. Paul was really smart. But the struggle here was that Paul is now writing to a group of people that can't even practice simple Christian etiquette. And what do I mean by etiquette? Well, we're supposed to have compassion for one another, right? We're supposed to love one another as Christ loved us. And to have people that are eating and drinking and doing things, and then you've got someone else that's not. Can you imagine if we had a potluck out there and we told somebody, well, you know, if you didn't bring anything, you can't stay. I've never heard that. But what I have heard, and maybe you've been on the end of it, is we have a potluck and you've forgotten about it. Or you're brand new here and we have a potluck and somebody says, hey, stay for the potluck. Don't worry about it if you didn't bring anything. I mean, I've heard that. I've heard you folks tell others about that. Come on in. That's okay. Come join us. We got plenty. God has blessed us. But can you imagine having a big dinner out there and somebody not being allowed to be a part of it. Can you imagine having to deal with somebody that's drunk at a church potluck? Now, people are different when they get drunk. Some people start laughing. Some people get mad. It seems like a lot of times your personality gets accentuated and you have no mute button. You'll say things, do things when you're drunk that you wouldn't do. So here's Paul writing to this church as a, as a pastor, as the elder, writing to it, and he's not dealing with theology. He's dealing with things like this, like a church that's partying and really not leaving their pagan ways. I think the, the most telling part is where the Apostle Paul says, do you despise God? Do you despise God? I think it's worse than his opening statement. I have no praise for you. There's nothing good I have to say. But then to go on and say, do you despise God? Well, I wonder what, what can I learn here? They were partaking in the Lord's Supper in a disgusting way. They were not honoring the body and the blood of Christ at all. And as history has gone on, we found that we've separated communion and the Lord's Supper into something completely different than what it started out as. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's different. Nobody's going to go home having pigged out on the little communion <laughs> wafers. I don't think anybody says, give me another round of those. Those are great. You know, you just barely get a chance to taste them. And a little bit of juice that's in that cup, even if it was vodka, you couldn't get drunk on that. So we've changed it. 
and we understood that it's not so much about the elements, but it's about what they represent, right? Who they represent, what they represent. So the amount is not important. Now we've whittled it down to these tiny little wafers and a little sip of juice, and it's the, res the resemblance the, uh, um, of what it reminds us of. So what does this all teach us? Well, number one, my actions not only affect me, but they affect others too. What you do, not just here, but out in the world, affect others too, because you are a representative of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. The things that you say, the things that you do, how you behave to others. Number two, my desires can cause division in the church when we stomp our foot and demand to have our own way. And it's hard when someone in a church does something like that and you feel like you're back in a kindergarten class and you have to say, no, it's not just you that's here. It's more than that. And then my behavior. My behavior causes my attitude to be out of sync and vice versa. My attitude can cause my behavior to be out of sync with God. So my actions, my desires, and my behavior, these are things that we have to have in tune with the Lord. So our second principle here this morning then is that the Lord's Supper reminds me who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We find that in Luke chapter 22. These are Christ's words as I read this this morning. Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Oh, well, what does that all mean? The Lord asked us to remember him in this manner. There's a lot of different beliefs about communion and as I was studying this week I forgot all the ones that I had learned when I was in school and I went back through um, the whole idea of transubstantiation consubstantiation and all the different things that different you know what the Bible says as I read the scripture it says that it is so that we can remember Jesus himself is sitting there holding bread the bread is the bread and the cup is the cup and nothing else it doesn't change it is representative of the body and blood of christ we remember that jesus died on the cross for us number three we remember that jesus shed his blood and sealed the covenant between god and his people that he sealed the covenant. What's that mean? Jesus Christ died one time for all, that all might be forgiven. He doesn't have to die again. There's no other sacrifice that needs to be offered again. It's his job that he did. It is finished. It is finished. Number four, we remember that we are united in Christ. I love how amazingly 
well that baptism and communion tie together. The symbolism is powerful as we are identifying with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. We're remembering what he has done. I don't know about you, but have you ever spent time? Have you gone someplace and just sat down and meditated on what Christ has done for you? Have you put the phone away? Have you allowed God to speak to you? Have you read Isaiah 53? Read it in the King James. Because the King James says, by his stripes we are healed. Stripes, what's that? It's the whip marks on his back. They do a beautiful job of translating with that. When I start thinking about all those things, and I start thinking about all the ways in which I fail God, even if after I've given my heart to Him, all the dumb things I've done, things I've said, careless words I've said, broken promises, we sang it, I thank you for the blood applied. The blood of Christ has literally been applied to our lives. We sing that old hymn. It's based out of deep theology and scripture. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We remember that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. He goes before the Father in heaven. He pleads our case. He talks to him on our behalf. We remember that we are redeemed from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people group, from every culture, from every situation, from every broken mess. We are redeemed. We are his people. He chose us. We did not choose him. He chose us. Long before he ever knew you, he paid the price. That's powerful. For the people that weren't even born yet, for the people that had already been born and died, we thank you for the blood applied. For it is by grace that you have been saved. By grace, through faith, and this not of yourselves but it is a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We remember that Jesus promised to come back for us. He promised. How many times do we go, now would be a good time, God? Now would be a good time. This world's gotten a little bit crazy. I think we've all said it at one point or time. If you're young and everything's going pretty good, wait. Your turn's coming. You will say it at some point in time. Now would be a good time, God. Principle number three, my attitude should be pure as I participate. Let's look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 27 through 34. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For there, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgments on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep but if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, 
we are being disciplined so that we will not finally be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. So my question here in this whole thing is like, what does unworthy mean? What does it mean? And really the, the other idea that is given here with these words in the original language means unfit. Unfit or unworthy. So we had to really dig that out. And Paul's meaning here is this directive to the Corinthian church that not only believers are to be reverent during communion, meaning this is not a time to play around, not a time to pass notes, not a time to tell jokes, not a time to be, you know, it's time to be reverent. So it's, but also our hearts are to be focused on Christ. Our hearts are to be focused on Christ. Attitude is more than just a state of mind. It's a condition of a person's soul. Paul challenged the Corinthians to check their reasons for participating in the Lord's Supper. So which one of us is worthy before the Lord, right? We say, okay, I, if I had to stand before the Lord and give an account and try to impress the Lord with all the things that I've done, I might be able to go pretty good for a while, but then he's going to say, yeah, but Rick, what about this? I'm going to stutter and go, uh, duh, duh, you know, so without the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. That's where he's our advocate, where he steps in and says, I paid the price. Their sin's forgiven. And that's powerful. Our worthiness is based on our heart condition. Okay, so when we're partaking in communion, our worthiness, whether we're fit to participate in communion, it's our heart condition. So if you drive in here and you and your spouse are on the outs and you just called him a no good blankety blank blank and then you walk in here and put on paste on your smile, I'm going to say that's an unfit heart condition. Just, just a wild guess there. But it might also be a personal struggle. A habit that you just won't break, won't tackle, won't deal with. I'm not saying something that you're ongoing struggle, because sometimes people that are struggling with habits can still have a right heart. Do you know what I mean? A right heart attitude. It doesn't mean we have it all together. If we had it all together, there's no need for a Savior, right? Mm-hmm. So... What happens when you walk, come in here and you blow up at your spouse and you call him a no good blankety blank blank blank? Well, I would suggest that before you partake in communion, you have a conversation with them and say, I was wrong to say all those mean things. And I just want to say I'm sorry. And then you need to talk to the Lord too. Because every time we do stuff like that to our spouse, to our kids, to others, it's not just them we need to apologize to. We need to ask forgiveness from the Lord too. That's what this is all about. And then we ask ourselves, why am I partaking? Is it peer pressure? Everybody else in the aisle took it. But I don't think I feel fit today. Then don't take it. And don't anyone else look down on that person that doesn't take it. It might be somebody new that doesn't understand what's going on. So we just pass it and we all keep a good attitude. If this is a remembrance of Jesus, if it means so much to us, so should your relationship with him. So it's not just that little bit of time in communion, but it's out there every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not just Sunday. If your relationship means so much to you, so should the purity of your heart. One common practice among churches is to have that time of self-examination. We're going to have a closing song here in just a moment. But we have that time of 
self-examination almost every time that we take communion. We need to ask ourselves, what should I be looking for in myself? I have five things, and Tim and I have talked about putting a slide up here, and we need to make that happen. But Tim, I have a list, and I think this needs to go up there. Here it is, number one. Am I just going through the motions? (sighs) I'm guilty. Even as a pastor, sometimes not focusing enough and just going through the motions. We don't need to do that. We need to focus. Number two, Am I concentrating on what the wine and the bread stand for, the juice and the bread stand for? Number three, am I acknowledging the suffering of Jesus in my place? Number four, am I free from unconfessed sin? Number five, am I being respectful in this partaking? 